focused on the relationships between a firm's short run costs of production, including its marginal cost, its average variable costs, and its average total costs. Now the concept that underlies and explains the shape of all of the firm's short run costs of production is the law of diminishing marginal returns. The concept that says that as you add a variable resource to a fixed resource, beyond a certain point the productivity of the variable resource declines, therefore the costs of additional units of output rise. This explains the upward sloping section of the marginal cost curve and the fact that average total costs, which represent the per unit costs of production in the short run, ultimately must increase. If a firm wishes to increase its output beyond a certain point, in this case beyond three units, we see that at any level of output beyond three units, this firm's average total costs increase, making it less and less economical for this firm to produce successive units. As this firm wishes to increase its production to six units, it will face higher costs. You can see that the cost is much greater. So the question then arises, at what point would a firm wish to expand its plant size so that it could reduce its costs once again? The reason the costs are rising in this example from C1 to C2 are that there is simply not enough capital to go around. This firm has experienced diminishing marginal returns, meaning that beyond three units of output, the firm's average costs only rises and it becomes more and more costly, therefore much more difficult to earn a profit if this firm wants to continue to produce beyond three units. The short run is defined as the fixed plant period. Only labor can be added or subtracted from the production of a good. So in the short run, if this firm wishes to expand its output beyond three units, the only way it can do so is by adding more and more workers to its fixed amount of capital. If this firm wishes to maximize its profits in the long run and it wishes to continue to produce more and more units of its good, how can it continue to keep its costs low? The answer is it must make a long run investment. The long run is defined as the variable plant period. In the long run, a firm can acquire new capital if demand for its products is growing or if demand for its product is shrinking, a firm can eliminate or get rid of some of its existing capital. In other words, it can open new factories or it can close its existing factories. It can add new technology or equipment to its factories. It can expand the amount of land that it employs in the production of its good. So the, the, the variable plant period is the period of time over which a firm can vary the amount of capital and land as well as labor. So at what point would a firm, such as that which we see here, wish to expand its plant size? Clearly, if the firm continues to increase its output beyond three units, beyond four units, beyond five and six units, its costs are only going to continue to rise. Of course, the higher a firm's average total cost, the lower its profits. This firm needs more capital. So the question then becomes, what happens to the firm's average total costs when it does acquire new capital? Let's assume that this firm's production was taking place with only one factory. So this firm, let's assume it's an airplane manufacturer. With one factory, it was able to produce three airplanes at a very low average total cost, but six airplanes at a relatively high average total cost. This firm needs another factory if it wishes to produce more than six airplanes. So I'm going to extend my quantity axis here so that we can see what happens when this firm adds additional factories to its production of airplanes. So this is our average total cost curve when this firm has only one factory. If the demand for this firm's product, I think we said it was airplanes, grew beyond three planes, four planes, six or seven, then this firm would benefit from opening an additional factory. The question is what would happen to its average total cost if it opened a second factory? I'm gonna draw a new average total cost curve here. Let's say that after the, this is three, four, after the fifth airplane, in order to produce its sixth airplane, this firm decides to open a second factory. Let's see how this would affect the firm's average costs. And there is now a new average total cost curve, which lies below the original average total cost curve. Of course, with this average total cost curve, there is a marginal cost curve as well, intersecting average total cost at its lowest point, which we have explained in previous lessons. So there's marginal cost two, now, what have we seen here? Now this firm, if it wishes to produce six airplanes, can do so at a lower average total cost 
than it would have experienced if it were still producing in only one factory. So here's our new average total cost. We'll call that C1. Without this second factory, the average total cost of six airplanes would have been much higher. We can see here at C2. Why did the average total cost of airplanes fall when this firm opened its second factory? Using the terminology in economics, we say that when the firm opens its second factory, it begins experiencing economies of scale. Now this word scale, what does it mean? Scale refers to size in this case. When this firm opens a second factory, it becomes a bigger firm. It is becoming a player. It is becoming larger. It is able to now produce airplanes, in this case, at a lower cost than it could when it was a smaller firm. As a small scale firm, the airplane manufacturer faces higher average costs of production. As a firm grows larger, its average variable costs and its average fixed costs tend to grow smaller. A firm begins experiencing what are called economies of scale. Some of the reasons that its average costs tend to fall include better bargaining power with labor unions. This means that a firm, once it becomes large, may be able to attract workers for lower wages than it could when it was only a small firm with one factory. It might get better prices from raw material providers. Our airplane factory, for example, could probably order aluminum and carbon fiber in bulk once it has opened its second factory. With only one airplane factory, the firm faces higher per unit costs for its raw materials. Once a firm acquires more capital, more technology, it reduces its production costs due to better productivity, due to higher quality and more capital. Productivity refers to the output per worker employed. More capital, better capital increases the productivity of labor and therefore reduces the costs of the firm. A firm, once it is larger, can take advantage of lower transportation costs. If an airplane manufacturer has to ship the parts for one or two or three airplanes across the country, then the per unit costs are going to be relatively high. However, once a firm is larger, it can take advantage of bulk ordering and bulk delivery, bringing down the per unit costs of delivery. Once a firm is larger, it tends to get more favorable interest rates from banks. A good example of this is if you were starting your own airplane company and you went to a bank to ask for a loan to buy some capital, chances are they wouldn't have much faith in your ability to repay that loan. Therefore, you would be charged a very high interest rate. If, however, you were Boeing or Airbus and you went to a bank to ask for a loan, you are going to get a much more favorable, a much lower interest rate, reducing your fixed costs, therefore reducing your average total costs. Increased size generally leads to better specialization. In one factory, this firm may have only employed 50 or 100 workers. Each worker had to do a lot of different tasks in that factory. However, once you have opened your second or your third factory, workers can now specialize. In other words, focus on the production of a very particular component or part of your product. This allows for reduced costs per unit cost, therefore bringing down the average total cost. These are just some of the examples of what we call economies of scale. Because of these factors, a firm in the long run as it opens additional factories as it adds capital to the production tends to experience lower and lower average total costs so let's assume that this firm after producing its eighth airplane decides that its costs are starting to rise too much once again so it decides to open another factory and we should see economies of scale lead to even lower average total costs. So with its third factory, this firm could hope to produce at a cost even lower than what it was able to achieve with its second factory. We can see here that costs continue to fall as the firm opens additional plants or factories, adds more and more capital and land to the production. So let's assume that this firm continues to grow. Demand for its products continue to increase. We can expect that over time, average total cost will decrease as additional factories are opened. So each ATC curve that I'm drawing here represents a short run average total cost curve achieved upon the opening of an additional factory. And its minimum average total cost continues to fall. Now this re refers, of course, to the minimum ATC of all the products that this firm is producing. 
So let's say that now this firm is, is very large. It is producing 14 units of its product. If this is jumbo jets, then yes, this is 14 airplanes. Because of its large size, because of its economies of scale, this firm is able to achieve a much lower average total cost than it could have ever hoped to achieve when it was producing only three airplanes or four or five airplanes. So will economies of scale occur forever? Predictably, it's not that simple. As a firm gets larger and larger, it can expect its average total costs of production to decline up to a certain point. So I'm going to connect the four different ATC curves that this firm has experienced. I'm going to connect these with a nice thick line here, which I have attempted to make tangent to the four ATC curves that I drew. This is the range of output over which the firm experiences economies of scale. Now another term for this is increasing returns to scale. As the firm grows, it's getting more and more from each unit of input that it employs towards the production of its good. So this is the range of output over which this firm experiences economies of scale. Or another word for that is increasing returns to scale. Now this is different than diminishing marginal returns because it actually explains why average total cost falls in the long run as output increases. This will go on for some time. Let's assume that upon opening yet another factory, however, this firm no longer experiences increases in the returns to scale. In other words, economies of scale are no longer being enjoyed as this firm opens its fifth factory. We'll call this ATC5. Notice that when this firm opens its fifth factory, the average, the long run average total cost curve begins to level out. This firm is no longer experiencing economies of scale. The average total cost achievable upon opening its fifth factory is no lower than it was upon opening its fourth factory. So when this firm produces 17 airplanes, its average total cost will be the same as it was when the firm produced only 14 airplanes. It is no longer achieving economies of scale. Now, what would happen if a firm grows even larger? If a firm continues to grow, it's conceivable, it's very possible, that eventually its average total cost will actually start to increase again. So I'll call this ATC6, and let's say it continues to grow. If, if average total cost eventually starts to rise, the firm begins to experience what we call dis economies of scale. In this case, as the firm opens its sixth, seventh, and eighth factories, the average total cost of airplanes or whatever the firm is producing begins to rise. This firm is now too big for its own good. This firm would be better off with only four or five factories. The firm has begun experiencing what economists refer to as diseconomies of scale. Diseconomies of scale. This might refer to factors such as communication inefficiency, corruption among the ranks of managers in these factories, anything else that might explain why a firm becomes inefficient as it grows too large. The firm is now inefficient. It is no longer able to achieve the low average total cost it was able to achieve when it was producing 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18 planes. Beyond 18 units, this firm, let's say it chooses to produce 25 units, the 25 units it's producing now cost this firm a much higher per unit cost than if the firm were producing fewer units. We're now back up to C1. The firm's average total cost has risen once again because the firm is no longer efficient at producing its product. The optimal number of factories that this firm should open is either four or five factories. Beyond five factories, the firm's average total costs start to rise. In the 1980s, General Motors, the largest car manufacturer in the world, broke up into four smaller car manufacturers, including Chevy and Chrysler, because it was too big for its own good. The firm could no longer compete with low-cost Asian car manufacturers, and it decided that the best thing it could do was break up into four smaller firms, each with fewer factories under its own management, and therefore lower average total costs.
So in this lesson, we've gone from the short run to the long run in costs of production. The eight different average total cost curves I've drawn on this graph each represent the firm's ATC as it opens additional factories due to growing demand for its products. Notice that at first, average total cost decreases. So there's a range of output over which, as a firm opens additional factories, it experiences what's called economies of scale. At some point, however, there are no further gains in efficiency of opening additional factories. We haven't identified this range yet, but we can call this range of the long run average total cost curve the constant returns to scale. As a firm, as this firm goes from four to five factories, it experiences constant returns to scale. Its average total cost is no longer falling, rather it is constant. The productivity of its resources is not increasing, rather it is constant. Beyond five factories though, this firm experiences a range of its long run average total cost over which ATC rises. So average total cost starts to increase if a firm becomes too big for its own good. This firm starts experiencing diseconomies of scale beyond 17 units of output, beyond five factories. A firm experiencing diseconomies of scale might be best off reducing the amount of factories, reducing the amount of capital and land it employs towards the production of its good. Because in the long run, the firm's costs are minimized the firm's average per unit costs are minimized at the lowest point on its long run ATC. So we can say that the ATC is minimized in the long run, that's long run ATC, only after the firm has experienced economies of scale. Now the concept of economies of scale will be referred to several times throughout theory of the firm. For example, a firm in an industry which requires large amounts of capital in order to achieve low average total cost, economies of scale might pose a barrier to the entry of new firms. Let's just talk about airplanes, for example. Boeing and Airbus have a virtual duopoly, a near monopoly on the manufacture of large airplanes due to the large economies of scale. If you or I wanted to open an airplane manufacturing business today, we wouldn't be able to compete with them because if we opened one factory, we would have such a high average total cost that we would never be able to sell airplanes for the lower prices that Boeing and Airbus are able to achieve due to their economies of scale.